Okay, so starting with the scripture reading from Proverbs 3, 9. Honor Yahweh from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. Okay, so now entering into the uh, typology of the Feast of First Fruits. It's been an interesting ride so far. So thank you all for hanging tight with me. Um, Just like the other ones, I'm going to start off with just a little recap to kind of catch you up to speed. So um, at this point uh, in the study, we have made a clear parallel between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So we have all seen how careful history was written in order to typify the future coming of Christ and the Messianic Kingdom. So God worked through His chosen people to establish redemptive history for all of man so that we may come to know Christ and His sacrifice for us so that we may know what his broken body paid for, so that we may now partake of the supper with the Lamb, as we'll do uh, this afternoon. So we discussed the Feast of Unleavened Bread last week and its relation to Passover, and how both, uh, both feasts are essentially one and the same. And today we will be speaking of the Feast of First Fruits. So hang tight. Um, we're going to do some scripture reading together. Um, It kind of helps me also control the speed of this. So if you remember in my previous teaching, I mentioned that the Bible is sufficient. uh, and We should wield it like a sword. I know you've heard Brother Stephen mention that as well. So that's my intention, right, going through the Bible and showing you how to build a trail through Scripture. So beginning now, you can see behind me on the board, uh, there's some days listed. So just to give you a visual, as I did last week, there are a couple handouts you'll see. So you can kind of write some scratch, chicken scratch on the paper there. Um, So starting with the Passover being on the 14th of Nisan, and then the beginning of the 15th of Nisan, marking the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the next feast obviously brings us to the first fruits. So... Where does this tie in, right? On what day? What is its significance? So on and so forth. So this brings us to the beginning. And let's all flip to um, Leviticus uh, chapter 23, verses 9 through 14. Again, just just to make or give some clarity... The Feast of First Fruits is in numerous places. It's in Deuteronomy, it's in Numbers, it's in Exodus, um, or pieces of it. So I just go to Leviticus again because it's chronologically in order. So Leviticus 23, verses 9 through 14. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest... You shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma, and the drink offering with it shall be of wine and a fourth of hen. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until the same day, until you have brought the offering of your uh, your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Okay, so see the instructions the Lord gave Moses here for the Feast of First Fruits. So what do they instruct them to do? I kind of want to walk through this together. So one, they're to bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. So if you want to know what sheaf is, a lot of people define it differently. Just think of it as a bundle, right? A bundle of grain. Um, they could go out in the cornfield cutting a bunch of stalks or whatever and bundling it up. So that's all that that is. Uh, number two, the priest shall wave or offer the sheaf before the Lord so that they may be, uh, that they may be accepted, right? So they get the, get the uh, sheaf, then they wave it before the Lord. Third, this will be done 
on the day after the Sabbath. And fourth, don't eat bread, grain, etc., until you have brought the offering before God. So, in other words, don't take part or don't partake of your harvest before you give what the Lord um, is due. So, the crops that were gathered at the beginning of the harvest season were called first fruits. Uh, they're also the first fruits of the barley harvest. So, they would have been planted in winter, right? Springtime comes, bam, barley's coming out of the ground. That's the first of the harvest. Um, a lot of times, like first fruits, right, is also translated in, in these aspects as the beginning. So when you go to like Genesis 1 1 and in the beginning, right, it has that same uh, meaning. So this would be the beginning of the first fruits. It also starts, it, it also has the root uh, word mixed in there of um, summit or the best. So I want to to go over that first and then get into how we should define first fruits because um, it has literal, figurative, spiritual, and typological meaning. Uh, it's a common expression in the Bible. So, does anyone care to take a guess like what first fruits means? Not a trick question or anything. <laughs> right? First to the, first of the crops, right? Um, uh, I wanted to start, right, this is going to be the bulk, you know, back-to-back -back of, of the Scripture reading here, but I wanted to start with some examples of how we should define first fruits. So if we turn to Genesis 49.3, that'll be our first reading. All right, Genesis 49, verse, or verse 3. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. So here, Genesis 49, 3, right? So we see here that first fruits is used as the firstborn. Okay, so we know it in the context in which we're reading that it's the first fruits of the crops, but you see this is, this is nothing new, right? So the first fruits in this passage represents the firstborn. So next, uh, let's go to Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 35. And you see, we're familiar with this um, in the New Testament, but it's important that I wanted to walk through the Old Testament to show you uh, that, it, that it does exist. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 35. Okay, so I'll read now. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. So in Nehemiah 10, 35, we see that it's used as the first produce brought forth from the harvest uh, given to the Lord. Okay, so next verse is going to be Jeremiah chapter 2, and then it's going to begin in verse 3. So that's Jeremiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it incurred guilt, disaster came upon them, declares the Lord. So you see in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 3, firstborn right, is used, but figuratively for Israel, right? They're holy unto God. So Israel is also God's first fruits. And lastly, um, the last example I want to give you is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. Brother Wayne knows what that is, I'm assuming. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and then it is coming those who belong to Christ. So we see here, Christ is the first fruits. So we've been over the harvest. We've been over that Israel could be the first fruits. We've been over that a firstborn could be the first fruits. And we've been over that Christ is the first fruits. So it's first fruits is used richly for the imagery, uh, the imagery all throughout the Bible and the Old and New Testaments. And like we always discuss, be sure your context is correct when reading about this. And if you're not careful, uh, you can get a completely misinterpreted understanding. Right, so you don't want to lead uh, with assuming that this is the first fruits for every single time. Right, so we're focusing right now on the feast of first fruits, and that being the harvest. So, people of God were called to give the best, most choicest items to the Lord first before they indulge in it. A couple examples of the items listed in the Bible are grain, oil, wine, honey, sheep wool, fruit, animals. Etc. So you get the picture. Um, the Israelites were acknowledging that everything they have comes from God. And they were exercising faith that if they were to give their very best away first, that they would be taken care of after. So that's basically, uh, I wanted to get into a little bit of defining what first fruits was because I thought that was important. So you see the faith exercise there, uh, trusting on God is what it is. God doesn't necessarily need uh, a sheaf of barley, you know. He just needs your faith. Now, when did first fruits occur? Sure. He doesn't need our faith. We need our faith. He requires our faith. Sure. Well, you're correct, and sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I'm no, you're right. A bit. No, you're very right. Not so. Sure. You're, you're, I'm not a, as good as a word smither as you. <laughs> uh, I try, I try, but you're, you're, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, so I want to get into when did first fruits occur, right? So a day was not given necessarily a day of the month, right? Um, the instructions simply were to wave the sheaf of grain a day after the Sabbath. And, well, we know that the Sabbath was Saturday, right? So this must have been on um, Sunday, right? Because it's after the Sabbath. So let me ask you this, and this may be a little confusing, and it should be, because it's our understanding, and I never understood it either. Why do we celebrate Good Friday? Right? What does... What does Good Friday represent? Anybody? Christ's crucifixion, right? Well, uh, how about Sunday, the following Sunday? Resurrection. But if Christ was supposed to stay in the grave for three days, how does that work out? If Christ dies on Friday and is raised on Sunday, that's not 72 hours. And it always bugged me because, you know, it's like as a first becoming a Christian, you know, me, I count on my fingers, so I'm like one, two, three, you know, and I'm like, well. And it, it, Maybe it's naming the days and not the duration. Sorry, no, sure, sure. And we know from all throughout Bible prophecy, as Je- go ahead. Jesus said the sign is as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, and he said that was exactly what was coming. <laughs> no, seriously, it, it's true. We know that's the prophecy, right? And that was, be the, that, that was going to be the only sign, right? So when the Pharisees were asking for that sign, they said, give us a sign. And he says, you adulterous nation, always seeking for a sign. A sign was a confirmation, right? It was a matter of fact. So when Jesus said that, I believe that was a full 72 hours. So if Passover happened on the 14th, right? And let me draw on the board here. Brother, Brother David got new markers. Pastor David did. So, right, so Passover's on the 14th, right? And let's see. Okay, so Jesus was taken down, right, in order not to defile the Passover before unleavened bread, which is the 15th. So we know 
that Jesus had to be taken down prior on unleavened bread, right? I'm just going to abbreviate here. Because this was a Sabbath. Okay? So, people would say that, obviously, this was Sunday, right? So, they say that first fruits occurred on the 16th. But, again, you see, you don't have your full 72 hours there. And we know that Jesus rose on Sunday. So, I want to explain to you what I believe to be true based on uh, the Scripture and a lot of stuff that we've already revealed through the, Levit- through the Levitical feast previously. So this is how the Levitical feast um, point towards Christ, right? And, and, and they flow together, and using both of them, you can hash this out. So beginning with Passover on the 14th, I believe that this was a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday, right? So the Sabbath, right, unleavened bread was on the 15th, and I believe that Jesus was already buried. Now we know that the day after Passover was a Sabbath, and we know that the Sabbath is Saturday, so Brother Andre, how can that be? But in, in, the, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we were told what? That at the beginning of the feast was a holy convocation, and at the end of the feast was a holy convocation. That was what was called a Sabbath, what was called a high Sabbath, right? Ordained by the Lord in the Feast of the Lord. So Thursday was a Sabbath. It was the high Sabbath, right? And then Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you see, uh, Saturday was the weekly Jewish Sabbath. And then the 21st was the end of unleavened bread. And that was the last high Sabbath of unleavened bread. So you see that connection there, right? So again, how we're, or I'll, I don't want to jump ahead. So anyway, so what we learned in unleavened bread that that was a Sabbath, right? So Friday, uh, or uh, the first and last days of unleavened bread were called or known as high Sabbaths. So the 16th uh, marked Jesus' second day in the grave, right? So you see, if Jesus died Wednesday, which I believe he did at the end of the day, the first, the first day was the 15th, second the 16th, and the third was the 17th. Do you have a time? The, time that, the end is the time that he died on that. Yes. And the very moment he rose on. Yes. So I believe on Wednesday he was crucified, right? And he, he, he died at 3 o'clock but was put in the grave at 6. Right? So he's put in the tomb at 6 because they had to put him in there, and that's the Sabbath they were talking about. They said, hey, we're going to defile the Sabbath. So Jesus died. Then that three hours there, and I'll get into that a little bit more, they had to put him in the grave. Right, no. So we see that the 16th marked Jesus' second day in the grave, and then Saturday the 17th marked Jesus' third and final day in the grave. So when Saturday ended and 18th Sunday began, Christ was missing from the tomb. So the confusion of this day from the Sabbath, right, is your Sabbaths. Get your Sabbaths correct. We've seen that uh, the confusion from unleavened bread and Passover, right? We're saying how could this be if, you know, Passover and unleavened bread, you know, or the sacrifices on unleavened bread, we've seen that those were used interchangeably, right? So... Same thing. When you're talking about a Sabbath, you have a, a, a holy convocation given through the feast, and then you have, of course, your weekly Sabbath. So, context, you know. There's 12 hours in a day. Right. So, if it's day and night, and it's 24 hours, that's one day. Absolutely, broken up into two 12 hour periods. Kind of like what we went on Passover. That's why when they said the Passover was f- sacrificed on the ninth hour, they were speaking on the second 12 hour period of the day from six. So, um, you know, I thought it important to mention this because I know there's some folks that celebrate Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, and I wanted to bring uh, clarity because it does dramatically change things if Jesus was not in the grave for three days. Um, now that we, you know, we have the timeline ironed out, uh, I want to get to the, not, more, not more good stuff because this is good, but to better stuff, right? So on your paper, I just kind of, that's why I gave those handouts so you can kind of see um, how that occurred. So now I'm going to do a little bit of comparing of the type to the anti-type. 
So by the way, does anybody have any questions about this timeline? Does it make sense at least? You know, feel free to. <laughs> okay, sure. Sure. Right. Well, yeah, and, it, and it's right, and it's if you were to lead in thinking that Saturday was the only Sabbath ever, but the feast, the feast gives the holy convocations the beginning of the end. It, it tells you that. So, Jesus, right, um, or um, the reason why they they didn't give a day, excuse me, for first fruits, it was the Sabbath because days change, right? So, and it just so happens that this year. There was three days between the high Sabbath and Sunday, which was. How the Jewish time. Yeah. How the Jewish time. It don't end like ours do. No. It doesn't start and end like ours do. So Sunday started. Yeah, Sunday started Saturday evening at six. Right. Right. So Jesus was out at. Jesus was missing from the tomb then. You know. Right. It, it, it would have been close to dark at that time. So. How does this represent Christ, and what is the significance? So let's start with after the death of the Passover lamb. As Jesus died, he was put into the tomb of the mountain for burial, right? Joseph of Arimathea had just had this nice carved out tomb, right? And you had to have a little money to do that. So they put him in the side of the mountain um, for burial, right? And the stone was rolled over. Well, at the same time, the high priest, when he killed the Passover lamb, he would take it into a chambers, right? It was inside the mountain of Mount Moriah, and that's where they would cook the lamb. So as you see Jesus in the side of the tomb of the mountain, right, you see the high priest inside of Mount Moriah, inside their chambers, which was the mountain Jesus was crucified, which was the mountain Solomon built the temple, which was the mountain that... Um, Abraham tried to sacrifice Isaac. So, um, you know, we see that Jesus was in the grave for three days, right? So the high priest would retreat into those chambers in the side of the mountain after the Passover sacrifice for three days, okay? So you see the high priest going in there for three days, Jesus in the tomb for three days. This is why it matters if Jesus wasn't in the grave for three days, because he perfectly fulfilled this. So after three days, we know that Christ left the tomb. Well, after three days, the high high priest exited the chambers of the mountain, right? Because now they, they had business, both of them. So the high priest exits the mountain after three days with all his cronies, and they would walk over the Kidron Valley Bridge. And on the side of Mount Olives... They had previously planted barley, right, specifically for this. Um, The Levites would locate the barley uh, that was already selected, right, before they went in the chambers. It was already bound. It was already wrapped up. They had the perfect offering before. Um, They would grab their sickles and cut the stalks of this barley, and they would put it into baskets uh, like they were harvesting. They would then take them to the temple, grind them to make loaves of bread, and then they would be offered to the Lord as first fruits. So on the 18th of Nisan, when Christ disappeared from the tomb, I'll tell you where he was, he was given the Lord God the first fruits of the uh, the choicest harvest, which was himself. So remember that no one was to eat of the harvest, right, until the Lord got his portion. So the priest doing this act of obedience, right, this in return consecrated the rest of the crops. It made them holy. So as the Lord God offered himself to Yahweh, first interceding on our behalf through the prophetic obedience, God in return satisfied with the offering, blessed the rest of the harvest. You see, so we had to give God the best of our crops in order for him to consecrate our harvest Jesus, doing the same thing, gave his body, right, the perfect lamb, the only thing that would be satisfied to the Lord as first fruits, and then in return consecrated his harvest. So you see the high priest offered this offering to the Lord, and after that, the the reaping of the harvest uh, 
began, right? People were allowed to go through their fields and reap. They could eat. They could partake. So when Jesus gave his body as the first fruits offering, the reaping of the true harvest began. And I have a verse to go to that's going to try to explain this. Go to uh, Matthew 27, verse 50. And hold on here. Uh, So Matthew 27, verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So this is when Jesus died, okay? And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Then it says, the tombs also were opened. However, there's a period there. And then it says, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and the Coming out of the tombs after his, res- after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So this verse, let's break this down. The tombs were open, right, at the crucifixion, but it says people weren't walking around until after the resurrection. So there's a three-day gap there. So when you're reading this, you see the tomb was open, right, at first fruits. Jesus died, well... Tombs were open. The tomb's opening showed the authority that Jesus had just conquered death. Okay? Jesus has power over death. Right. And then after the resurrection, right, what did he do? Well, the high priest we see and just offered up the grain offering, right? And then in return, they were allowed to reap the harvest. So Jesus offering himself to God. As first fruits offering, God is satisfied. Well, what happens immediately after? This is the reaping of the harvest of God. That's why the saints were out. That's why they were brought out of the grave. Now, sorry, I'm getting chills. Um, no. This was always preached to me as the authority of God, and it is. But it directly correlates typologically to the feast. That's why it's important to... To, to go through the feast and work through these. Um, now, whether these were the first erec- uh, resurrected or, or not, I'm not going to get into eschatology, but I will get in, if you want, just for food for thought. And you can turn there. You don't have to. Revelation 14.4, right? You see that the 144,000, right, Jews talked about being resurrected, right? That these were the kind of first fruits of God, um, Whether or not you tie that in is up to you. I think that requires a lot more study. But my personal belief is that this is what that was. These were the first fruits of the people, right, who chased themselves unto God. Um, And then then think about this. Think about when Jesus was, was saying, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. And then put that into perspective, right? Jesus doesn't just say things, you know. So, anyway, really amazing, right? So, so you see Jesus as an offering to consecrate believers, not crops, so that he may go and reap the harvest of saints. So, with all those comparisons that we have um, and went over, we now see the blessed lamb is Jesus Christ and is also, in fact, the first fruits. So, if you would, I, didn't, I forgot to put this um, ver- or this verse in your handout, but it's Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verse 11. I think it's worth reading. So Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, Then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once and for all into the holy places, not by the means of blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. So that right there, you see, one, Christ is our high priest. It makes that connection, obviously. But 
this was this was this was the purpose, right? This was the fulfillment. Um, so with all that understanding, I want to go over um, a couple details in the New Testament that were always a bit confusing um, to me, but I hope to kind of provide clarity. Uh, and with the first fruits, right, knowing and understanding how we work through this, I hope this makes sense. So let's turn over to John chapter 20, verse 16. So this is after the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection. I mean, excuse me, after the crucifixion of Jesus, but before the ascension to the Father. So Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to the Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. So hold that thought and go further down the page to John 27 and 28. Uh, Excuse me, chapter 20, verse 27 and 28. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Well, why could Thomas touch him and not Mary? It's because Jesus had not yet ascended. Jesus was not offering himself to Mary, but to God. So Mary would have defiled the lamb and been the first partaker of the first fruits offering, but that was not for her to do. The offering was for God the Father. Uh, This is why after the ascension, Thomas could touch him beforehand, but Mary could not. And um, I hope you see that clarity because that always bothered me that why, why, he, why did he say, don't cling to me, you know, don't touch me? Because he was consecrating himself, right? He was a perfect substitute and he was going to God the Father and that was for God, uh, not Mary. So, um, you know, now we see here that Jesus Christ did just as the high priest had done to perfectly fulfill the prophecy and uh, typological significance that he set forth because he was the anti-type of the high priest. So the fact that I was going to put in here in the order of Melchizedek, but I didn't want to stir Paul up. (laughs) Um, The fact that Israel was also God's first fruits, that also, because we we read there, I believe it was in Nehemiah that, or Jeremiah, that uh, Israel was God's first fruits. So that also anticipated the entering of God's kingdom by the Gentiles, Right? a.k.a. the rest of the harvest. So, as we are accepted in, into the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ, we are given uh, the Spirit as first fruits, according to Romans 8.23, right? So, this is our first fruits. Or you could say, earnest money, right? Before we reach fulfillment and glory, which is promised to us. So, you see, when there's first fruits, there's always something to come next. So when Paul said to Jesus, or that Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, right, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, he was drawing an analogy between the Old Testament offering and Jesus' resurrection. So Jesus not only defeated death, but promised those who believe that they would also defeat death. Oh, death, where is your sting? So what good would this promise be if Jesus did not rise from the grave, Right. So you see, Jesus is who he says he is. And Jesus fulfilled what he sent out prophets for. And Jesus does have power over the grave. So the Passover is all about substitutionary death of Christ. Unleavened bread is about redemption, right? Unleavened bread is not about the burial because because Jesus was buried, you see, before unleavened bread. People preach that unleavened bread is about the burial, But Jesus was buried on Wednesday, not the first day of unleavened bread. So uh, unleavened bread is about redemption. And the first fruits is about resurrection. So I'll I'll put put this in your mind. When that tomb was given, 
uh, from Joseph of Arimathea to God, right? You had to be wealthy. That was a big deal to put some guy you didn't know in your tomb. But the tomb was just being borrowed for the weekend. So you can see how easy that would have been. I actually... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's a good point. Brother Wayne's... Yeah, well, Brother Wayne said, do you think he would even put himself in that tomb after that happened? Probably not. Yeah. But I'll end with this verse. It's, it's 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 20 through 23. Uh, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after that, those who are Christ at his coming. So I hope that you guys were, you know, blessed as much as I was with this teaching on first fruits. And um, does anybody have any questions about anything? Yep. Amen. Uh, Wayne. What did you say? The scripture says, because he lives, we live. That's uh, Brother, or Pastor David, did you say something? Well, I was going to say, which particular passage do you hold to the point out specifically concerning the, all of these events that 15 was a high Sabbath and that so, yeah, I like Leviticus because it's um, it's chronologically in order. So, if you go to Leviticus uh, chapter twenty-three, it breaks through every feast. So it'll say this was on the you know. So we know on the tenth, right, the lamb was taken. On the fourth, it was sacrificed, right. That was the examining time, and then unleavened bread was the very next day. It tells you that was the fifteenth. When you get to first fruits, it tells you it was after the Sabbath, right? Um, and from that time, obviously, we know that Saturday was a Jewish Sabbath because if you look in Leviticus 23 in the beginning, it goes over the Sabbath first, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, no, it says a Sabbath, right? So you would have to go to Unleavened Bread where it would say that the first and last day of Unleavened Bread is a holy convocation, right? There will be um, rest, right? No doing work, no doing anything, right? And then that's where you would draw that correlation. And then if you wanted further stuff, you would have to go to like the Talmud or Jewish rabbinical teaching. But I simply like the fact that it calls it out in the instruction of Unleavened Bread, That, that answer your question, or and then you can go to kind of like uh, Deuteronomy and Numbers will elaborate too more on these feasts, but you would have to look up like uh, holy convocations and what that meant, and then draw the correlation between the Sabbath and that too, because they're the exact same. It, it, it would take a little bit of study to get that. Sure, sure, but and you got to understand too that we're what is it, thirty five hundred plus, you know, year or thousand years. So, at the time, these things make sense, right? So, these scribes are writing this Bible, and they're saying, oh, well, hey, this is a Sabbath, or this is a a high day, or this is a Sabbath. It's kind of like, I didn't know about feast proper, right? Or or combining Passover and uh, unleavened bread. And the Bible did it, but I took it as a misinterpretation. Because I'm like, oh, well, they said unleavened bread here and Passover here. So, yeah, that, that took extra study. Does anybody else have anything? Or if not, I'll, I'll break us in prayer. Uh, dear most gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for uh, your majesty, Lord. We thank you for your greatness and your sovereignty. And we ask that we always remain students, Lord, that you, uh, that you keep us in your word, Lord, that we're Bereans, as Acts says, and that we're always uh, making sure that what is said is true, Lord, uh, according to your word. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you bless this upcoming 
study, Lord, or this sermon here given by Pastor David, Lord, and then the following Lord's Supper where we take bread and blood in remembrance of you, remembrance of your death on the cross and the resurrection in which we just spoke of, Lord. That we thank you and may we give you a life of obedience and gratitude uh, for your finished work and your sacrifice on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.